Good evening, everyone. We really appreciate that you have joined us this evening, uh, despite the weather conditions. Mind you, it is quite beautiful out there, really. Um, so, of course, another evening of our Religious Life Lecture Series through Campus Ministry and King's University College. Very pleased to have another uh, inspiring evening tonight. I would like to, um, well, I, I should introduce myself. My name is Melissa Page Nichols, and I am Pastoral Counselor with the Office of Campus Ministry at King's. I would like to call on Dr. David Sylvester, who is our principal at King's University College, to introduce our speaker for this evening. Stop, Mary McLaughlin. Thank you, Melissa. It's very nice to be here with you, and let me echo her welcome to all of you. It's my great pr pleasure as principal to welcome my good friend back to London and a good, great friend of King's, Dr. Michael Higgins. Now, Michael, I think the first time I ever met you or introduced you at a talk was a long time ago, back in Vancouver. You had come out to speak to the, the uh, students and faculty of St. Mark's in a new Catholic college called Corpus Christi. Now, in real time, that's about, or in, we, the, one way we measure that would be probably 11 or 12 years ago. But in, by the Higgins scale, that's about six books, a dozen or so radio documentaries, and too many, many scholarly articles op-eds and interviews to even consider. So, long time ago, not so long. Michael Higgins is many things, but I think, given the turnout tonight, I think many of you know him. How many of you have heard Michael speak before? How many of you heard him on radio? How many of you have read one of his books? Okay. So, no stranger to most of you. The word I would use to describe Michael Higgins is relentless. It seems to fit rather nice, nicely. During his presidencies at St. Jerome's and St. Thomas University in Fredericton, Michael was a force for Catholic higher education across this country. And I say that from personal experience. He's a mentor of mine as a young president some years ago, not so many years ago. His academic work was bolstered by his ever-present voice in the public realm and through his leadership in the National, North American, and International Associations of University Presidents. His study of Catholic creative culture and how it intersects with the broader community and society continues to shape, even though he's in the States now, the discourse about the history and, the, and nature of Canadian culture. For those of you, and I don't think there are many here that don't know Michael's work, he's a native of Toronto, is an award-winning and best-selling author, Vatican Affairs Specialist for the Globe and Mail, CTV Network. I think you've even done some work with our own chaplain, Father Michael Bechard. He's a Catholic educator, of course, CBC radio documentarian, scholar, and administrator. He was for many years a professor of English and Religious Studies at St. Jerome's at the University of Waterloo, where he also served as chair, associate dean, vice president, and president, and vice chancellor. He assumed responsibility as president and vice chancellor of St. Thomas in Fredericton, New Brunswick in 2006. Professor Higgins is currently professor of religious studies and Vice President for Mission and Catholic Identity at Sacred Heart University in Fairfield, Connecticut. We're happy you got on the plane out of that weather on the East Coast. He has edited, co-edited, authored, and co-authored 13 books, including just a few, The Jesuit Mystique, Power and Peril, The Catholic Church at the Crossroads, Heretic Blood, Spiritual Geography of Thomas Merton. That's your first Merton book. We've got another one on the way, Michael. Um, my Father's Business, a biography of his, of his eminence, GM at Cardinal Carter, and I'm sure we have that one in our library at King's. We have them all. The Muted Voice, Religion in the Media, Stalking the Holy, The Pursuit of Saint Making, Suffer the Children Under Me, An Open Inquiry into the Clerical Abuse Scandal, and Genius Born of Anguish, which you can find at the back of the hall, The Life and Legacy of Henry Nouwen. Michael is a regular contributor to Commonweal and the Literary Review of Canada, and a columnist for the Telegraph Journal and the Irish Catholic. He is a recipient of many awards, the most recent of which is the 2013 Gold Medal for International Radio Documentaries awarded in the New York festivals. And most importantly, I think, for those of us from Southwestern Ontario, Michael was recently elected as a senior fellow of Massey College, University of Toronto. Well deserved, Michael. Tonight, Professor Higgins will speak to us of two areas of his many specialties, Merton and Nowen, architects of our spiritual wisdom. Michael, welcome back to King's. <laughs> 
with this gun. I just put the other on, right? Can everyone hear me? I guess you can. Eh? That's clear enough. The acoustics are a little difficult, so if you find it uh, difficult to hear me or there's not sufficient clarity, please uh, don't hesitate to come up closer. It's a pleasure to be back at uh, King's, as David says. This is, I think, my sixth time that I've come through at least three principalships uh, to give public lectures. I have a, a real fondness for the institution, for its history. It was, of course, our delicious competitor for many years when I was in southern Ontario, and it has a wonderful staff and ethos. So it's a, a wonder and a pleasure to be back, and a privilege. It's also a relief. A relief in that I was asked not to talk about Rob Ford. <laughs> you have no idea what it's like being a Canadian in exile in the United States right now. For four years, I've lived underneath the radar screen. People have a highly romanticized view of Canadians. American academics particularly are very fond of Canadians, but it's highly romanticized. Uh, and they, they consider us basically incorruptible. It's not true, of course, but basically. And I must say that I encouraged this um, caricature of history because it seemed to me, why not? Now that's all changed. Completely. Right. And I, I try to zero in and say, well, you know, there are other things going on in Canada that might interest you. A Senate that's less functional than yours. Um, uh, the latest uh, libidinous exercises of one Justin Bieber that seems to attract universal attention and is from Stratford, Ontario. Um, I said, there's so many different things, but you always alight on the mayor. And they do. And at first I thought, well, this could be contained because it's just the gutter press, the New York Post or some other such magazine. CNN, say, not anymore. It's on the venerable PBS, Public Broadcasting System, National Public Radio, and we own a station in that network. In spite of vigorous efforts on my part to exercise censorship, they've all failed. And uh, the front pages of the, of the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal <laughs> So we've arrived. And so the opportunity to get out of the country now, just for a bit, so that I don't have to give an explanation uh, for the phenomenon that Toronto is uh, languishing under uh, is, a, is, a, is a genuine treat. And I can tell you this from the outset. Rob Ford and Doug Ford have nothing in common with Thomas Merton and Henry Nowen. <laughs> it would be an entirely different lecture uh, if that were the case. So it's a pleasure to be back. What I want to do tonight, and thank you first of all for coming out in this uh, uh, really inclement weather. Uh, it's so easy to just to stay put and safe, so I, I appreciate you taking the time to come out tonight. What I want to do is I want to put them in some kind of comparison or juxtaposition. Both of them are principal architects of our spiritual reality. They are remarkable men. And there are extraordinary similarities, and there are striking differences, and there are interesting interdependencies. So this is not an exhaustive undertaking, but what I'm going to do is just alight on some of them for you tonight, and then we'll stop for uh, a brief period for question and answer or clarification. The British professor emerita and authority on spirituality, Ursula King, in her book, The Search for Spirituality, our global quest for a spiritual life notes the following, and I quote, our image-soaked and information-drenched society can be experienced as a total spiritual wasteland. But its haunting emptiness and superficiality, its frequent lack of substance and depth, is not always totally wasteful, for it also carries fertile soil for new growth. Many contemporaries, bereft of traditional identities, experience the world as a wilderness where firm ground seems lost and no well-trodden paths can be trusted. Yet this experience opens them up to the possibility of search and experiment, to look for a spirituality less defined and closed, more dynamic and open-ended. Now this reads with a marvelous resonance or appositeness in the context of the new pontificate 
of Bergoglio. Pope Francis obviously is someone who believes profoundly in Catholicism as expansive, inclusive, deeply committed to mercy, deeply committed to the pastoral project. And in no small part, I'm inclined to think, will be a major source for rejuvenating uh, that wasteland. Now, there are two spiritual writers who meet the bill of articulating a spirituality for our contemporary and secular culture, Thomas Merton and Henry Nouwen. They are ideal models of post-conciliar spirituality. Although Merton, a monk, a poet, an essayist, and a diarist par excellence, anticipated the council, the Second Vatican Council from 1962 to 1965, his work on returning to the sources, monastic and biblical, and his exploration of ecumenical and interfaith points of convergence established him as a figure easily validated by the council and its insights. Nowen, a psychologist, a professor, and a spiritual writer, was very much a product of the council, shaped by its teaching and custom-changing dynamic. Their unique contributions, now what do they have? What are these unique contributions? Let me delineate them. Number one, the recovery of the contemplative tradition for the larger church. Number two, the reclamation of interiority and mediation as crucial ingredients of any meaningful humanist philosophy or anthropology. Number three, their commitment to the recovery of vital streams of life, largely neglected by the official church. And number four, their theological extraterritoriality. Great phrase. George Steiner, the eminent uh, literary theorist who taught at Cambridge for many years and then at the University of Geneva, talks about this notion of extraterritoriality, where you remain unhoused within a specific culture, tradition, or language, and you live outside in the pioneering spirit. I'll give you an example. The great Irishman, James Joyce. Um, no, I'm sorry. Yes, James Joyce is a great Irishman. But it's that other great Irishman, Samuel Beckett, wrote his play, Waiting for Godot, and many of his other works in French. French was his preferred language. Conrad, Polish, chose English. Nabokov, Russian, chose English. Borges, Spanish, chose to write in English. So they choose to write in a language other than their own. It's a form of existing outside the territories, outside the boundaries. And interestingly enough, was an initiative that preceded what we now call post-modernity. All of these qualifications or characteristics are a matter of the public record. They are enduring features of their respective legacies, signature notes of their creative, organic, and yes, in many ways, fundamentally conservative spiritualities. I think this is important to understand, folks. We have a tendency sometimes, I think, to look at the radicality of some of our spiritual writers as if they are adrift, subversive, iconoclastic. When a careful examination of their roots, their genesis, and their thinking will find as actually rooted in the tradition they critique. This adds to their credibility and indeed to the quality of their work. The American Trappist and the Dutch priest. So what did they share in common? Okay. They were both children of the 20th century. Merton was born in Prades, in the Pyrenees, the south of France, in 1915 and died in 1968. People often forget that Merton was a Frenchman. We think of him utterly as American, and yet he took out citizenship in the United States 1950, 1951. His mother was an American, his father was from New Zealand, and he was born in the middle of a war in a remote part, Prad, on the Rue de Justice, in a small little town in the Pyrenees. The only way you can get access to it is on Le Petit Trangent, which takes you up the mountains. That's where Thomas Merton was born, not New York. Henry Nouwen, born in 1932 in a small village in, in the Netherlands, died in 1996 back in Holland and then returned to Canada for his official burial and interment here in Canadian soil. They were enthralled by the fields of psychology and psychiatry. This is very important to understand. They included numerous experts among their friends, drew on the work of pioneers in each of the disciplines, both to write about and to employ for their own benefit. 
Merton experienced acute, though not clinically, uh, um, clinically determined depression, now and did. Now and experienced uh, serious clinical depression and, uh, and an act of, it seems to me, extraordinary barbarism for his therapy they sent him in the winter to Winnipeg. <laughs> Can you imagine that? <laughs> January, they say you're gonna have some detailed therapy, you're going <laughs> to Winnipeg, okay? Not Victoria, mm -hmm. not Halifax, but Winnipeg. Six months of intensive therapy, he came back and then was readmitted to the Nauen community. And then of course he did what Nauen always did, which Merton did as well during his period of depression. He had two acu acute, though not clinically defined periods of depression, one in the early 1950s, one in the late 1950s. But both men did is they wrote about it. So we know, either in their private journals or in their published work, we know what was at the root of the depression and how in an important way, grace, God is experienced in depression. Their struggles with their respective sexualities. Merton was straight and Henry was gay. But these struggles were constitutive of their spiritual journey to maturation and integration. Both men struggled with their sexuality throughout their lives, including their ministry. They both developed a spirituality of peacemaking that was both all pervasive and controversial. I love the story about uh, the two of them uh, separately, discreetly, because they only met once, by the way. But when Nowen came to the United States on a senior fellowship at the Menninger Clinic in Topeka, Kansas, one of the premier centers for psychiatric research, Okay, he leaves Holland and he comes over, and he's there. He no sooner arrives, it's 1965, and Martin Luther King has his big march on Washington. Nowen knows implicitly that this is a moment of the Kairos. This is a moment of the Lord. As a minister of the gospel, where's he supposed to be? He should be with them. So he gets a car and he drives from Kansas. He's never been in the States. He has no idea where he's going. And he makes it to Washington to be part of the parade. Richard Seip, there were four priests, uh, one Australian, I think two Americans and one Dutchman. And they were all part of this uh, senior fellowship in psychiatric research, in religion, psychiatry. And uh, the only one who went was the Dutchman. And Richard, Richard Seip said, you know, it didn't dawn on us that he did what we should have done. He stood in solidarity and it, with compassion for people he didn't even understand, but he knew, he knew that that's where the peacemaker should be. So when people sometimes talk about now and his development in interest in peacemaking was a, a later and perhaps even faddish development, they're wrong. It was there from the beginning arguably even there from the time of his young adolescent experience with the Nazis. They experienced at their core the exacting demands of compassion in a time of dislocation. They feared the soul-destroying power of the cult of the celebrity. We were talking about this tonight, that one of the real threats to the integrity of spiritual life is when the spiritual figure himself or herself becomes a celebrity. Whereas in most spheres of life, this is important, high professional profile, followers, disciples, high marketing, all this kind of stuff, it's critical. In the spiritual life, it runs counter to what is the demands of interiority and kenosis. The genuine spiritual figure is engaged in the process of self-emptying not self-aggrandizing. It's a very different model. And so both of these men knew we're becoming more and more famous. You know, Merton, Merton at one point had three secretaries just carting the mail up, carting the mail up. Now, and there are 18,000 letters in the archives in Toronto. I know, I'm the official biographer of Henry Nowen, and I have to go through each one of these letters. 
I have already got through 100. <laughs> and every time, every time I get through and I tell the archivist, oh, I just, she says, well, you're not going to believe this, Dr. Higgins, but we just got several new letters from Moscow or from Ukraine or someplace, and now they're coming into the archives. And so we have, uh, just to give you an idea of how prolific they were, because this is an important quality that they shared, deeply prolific men. Uh, Gabriel Earnshaw, who is the, uh, now an archivist and archivist for the John Kelly Library at the University of St. Michael's College, she calculates that the literary material that we have for now and alone constitutes one half of a Canadian football field. Now, I don't know what the difference between a Canadian and an American football field is, but I do know either way a, a football field is big. <laughs> and I know I have to read all of this. His books have been translated into something like 26 languages. There are 7 million copies extant. There are documentaries, films, dissertations. I sat as an external for a doctorate dissertation just about a year and a half ago uh, in Toronto U of T for a dissertation on now, and, and there are many more in process. He's an industry. It's the now in industry. But the now in industry follows very successfully from the Merton industry. And Merton wrote a very critical article many years ago talking about what he called the Joyce industry, about James Joyce, not realizing, of course, he himself would become an industry. By the time he died, there were over 50 books that he had written. Uh, 50 books, and you average that he didn't begin to write seriously until he was 26. He dies in 1953, so on average, that's two published books a year. At the same time as he is variously master of scholastics, master of novices, and maintains a remarkable correspondence with the mighty and the humble, with the famous and with the not so famous. Both of them do. I can only say, as having been, uh, that I wrote a biography in Merton, I was not the official biography, but I am the official biographer of, um, of Nowen. And I, I have to tell you how happy I am that both men died before email. <laughs> they, they, the, the possibility of going through that as well is daunting beyond belief. And they remain throughout their writing lives quintessentially autobiographical. You want to know about Henry Nowen? Read Henry Nowen. You want to know something about Thomas Merton? Read Thomas Merton. They'll tell you. They use the fodder that is their own material and their own struggle. Both men ate into holiness. You know? You know how sometimes our heart aches for something. We yearn for something. We yearn for it so profoundly that it, it disorients us sometimes. It defines us. Could even become an idée fixe. Both men ached into holiness. They yearned for it and were often frustrated simply because they were deeply flawed men. Yes, deeply flawed. But they wrote about their flaws. It's like everything else. They wrote about it because the writing was an act of connection, an act of sharing. That's why people read them. They don't spend a great deal of time plowing through Merton's profoundly dense, abstruse, later Blakeian antipoems. They can't figure them out. But they can understand when they read the private diaries, or when they read Seeds of Contemplation, or No Man is an Island, or some of these other books, they find there's a voice there that speaks to them of their experience. Similarly with now, similarly with now, that they manage to discover in their voice something that allows them to live vicariously in their readers. Okay. I wish to explore now some of the commonalities to be found in their work as spiritual diarists, honest chroniclers of the soul's progress, pioneers of the heart's horizon. Okay, is, is this clear? Can you hear me? Are there any difficulties with the acoustics? Okay, all right. As a diarist, Merton recorded a fully Catholic range of subjects. He wrote of the various hues and contours of the clouds of the flora and fauna to be found on the vast Gethsemane grounds, of the litany of characters to be found both within and adjacent to the monastic enclosure, of the variety of sounds to be heard in the Gethsemane woods, 
and of the changing of the seasons in the Kentucky hillside. He was a nature poet. One of the reasons why we love reading the sound uh, sign of Jonas or a vow of conversation or conjectures of a goody bystander is he inserts us in the rhythm and power of nature itself. I remember quite a few years ago when I first began to do my research on, on Merton, and I was in the first tranche, the first stream of Merton scholars. Merton had only been dead in 1968, and I began my work on him in 1971. So I, I got to know all the biographers, the abbots, the monks, the original research and all this, because I, I, I just happened to be on the right guy at the t right time. And I went to Gethsemane, five lakes, hundreds of grounds, lots of critters all over the place. I remember one time being uh, chased by a goose, um, got whipped up, and they, they moved real fast, coming down there, hissing on that road, chasing, and they chased me, and a priest who was with me over a fence. He dumped, jumped into a ditch. He's more cowardly than I am. And I went over the fence, and <laughs> I remember I got over the fence, and I came back to the monastery afterwards, and... Um, he said, hey, you don't look very good. And I said, wow, it's humiliating to be chased by a goose. And, but I ended up going over the fence, and I had eaten lots of their bourbon-laced fruitcake. Okay. That was the one thing they allowed you to eat between meals, is they brought out this bourbon-laced fruitcake. And I didn't know it was laced with bourbon. All I knew was it tasted good. And so I kept eating it and eating it and eating it. So I was partially inebriated. So, but not only that, I had stepped over, or not stepped over, a electrified fence. So I partially electrified myself, electrocuted myself. So I, I, got, I got in and I said, this is the wonderful thing about nature, it can kill you. Okay. I got the fruitcake, I've got the goose, and now I've got an electrified fence. Nature, um, there was a strange uh, premonition in that, well, premonition is not the right word, but prefiguring, of course, because that's how Merton died, as you remember, by electrocution. But it wasn't on Gethsemane grounds, it was in Bangkok. Merton's enthusiasm for a new book, a just discovered author, a fascinating idea, would jostle with cynical asides and sardonic humor on the same page. His diary entries were a means of self-exploration, a mode of earnest dialogue with the anonymous reader and with himself. Some of the entries are nature portraits, some are compilations of things done, or books to be read, or some are introspective exercises, some are mature meditations, and some are simply vehicles of frustration or anger. There are diary entries that serve as short essays, like the piece on the Uberstembahnführer, Adolf Eichmann, and Hannah Arendt's notion of the banality of evil. And there are diary entries that function as short mystical expositions, like the piece on the Pont Vierge, the Virgin Point. Merton's diaries reveal the man. They are direct, they are personal, they are honest, and sometimes, yes, they're funny. But, and this is important to consider in the light of the making and the remaking of the poet of Gethsemane, they were subject to careful editing and rewriting. In short, the fresh, private voice of the diarist is a fine example of disciplined spontaneity. Merton wrote to be published, and he intended that his private ruminations become public property, so he wrote for the reading eye. Although all biography is a form of exhibitionism, it is controlled exhibitionism. Merton's diaries are not passive things. He thinks, wills, and he feels in his, in his journals. They are fragments of an ongoing conversation between him and us. A vital dialogue, a kind of spiritual direction. Their immense popularity is in part attributable to the fact that in spite of his extraordinary gifts, he is portrayed as a common wayfarer and his search for the true self to be alone with the alone, is a search available to anyone. The diaries reveal the many voices of Thomas Merton, the voice of the garden with its discipline and the voice of the field with its wildness. George Woodcock, the Canadian scholar from Vancouver, has observed apropos a discussion of Merton's poetry, the voice of the choir and the voice of the desert. Merton's diaries are at once seductive 
disturbing, amusing, and oracular. They care not a whit for consistency or for the straitjacket of logic. They are eclectic, allogical, with a heavy dose of Swiftian wit and Zen wisdom. Merton was effusive all the time. Somebody would come in and say, look, there's a wonderful book by René Char, or I've just read this by Derrida or Rob Gillet, or there's this book by Cheslov Milosh, or there's a book by Walter Lamb, well, it wouldn't be Walter Lamb, but a book by Emerson or something like that. And he would read it, and he would write in this diary, this is the best book I've ever read. So as you're going through, you would see this, this wonderful, almost adolescent-like enthusiasm. He could never achieve satiety. Every time he read a book, he would devour it, and he would devour the person who wrote the book. So whether it was either Henry Vaughan, uh, one of the great 17th century English divines, or whether it was an anthropologist working with the Shoshone in California, or somebody working with the Zapot Zapotecas in, um, in Mexico, in the old Mayan culture. It didn't matter. Now, he was a, um, a polyglot. He spoke several languages, French, obviously, English, German, Latin, Greek, uh, Spanish and Portuguese, uh, was learning on a daily basis, about 15 minutes a day, didn't amount to much, but he was working uh, on Mandarin uh, around the time he died. So he's a vor voracious lover of words. So he would read these authors and he loved them, but the next day he could turn on them. Oh, that was a terrible book. Can't stand that. The, the incredible volatility in his emotion and in his thinking is both attractive and disturbing. Brilliant and yet strangely eclectic. The finest of his, of his diaries shows the skillful juxtaposition of shadow with light, kind of spiritual chiaroscuro, the luminous with the demonic, the tranquil with the menacing specter. Here's a passage. I sweep. I spread a blanket out in the sun. I cut grass behind the cabin. I write in the heat of the afternoon. Soon I will bring the blanket in again and make the bed. The sun is overclouded, the day declines, perhaps there will be rain. A bell rings in the monastery. A devout Cistercian tractor growls in the valley. Soon I will cut bread, eat supper, say psalms, sit in the back room as the sun sets, as the birds sing outside the window as night descends on the valley. I become surrounded once again by all the silent zoos and foos, men without office and without obligation. The birds draw closer to their nests. I sit on the cool straw mat on the floor, considering the bed in which I will presently sleep alone under the icon of the nativity. Meanwhile, the metal cherub of the apocalypse passes over me in the clouds, treasuring its egg and its message. The metal uh, cherub, of course, is a bomber. Merton's uh, diary entries are often unsubtle more than they are sued. Their homiletic power is to be found less in the grand rhetorical flourish, a stylistic tendency which Merton on occasion indulged, and more in their capacity to jar us out of moral complacency. Perhaps at no time was the need for self-revision and growth more spiritually and emotionally imperative than when he put his pen to his relationship with M, the Louisville nurse with whom he had fallen in love in 1966. In 1968, when Merton dies, he's 53. In 1951, he goes in for back surgery in a hospital, St. Joseph's in Louisville. When he comes out of the anesthetic, he sees uh, a remarkable young, attractive woman, and this nurse will, in many ways, become his lover. Because he's Merton, this will be chronicled in great <coughs> detail for a long period of time. And they will remain what are called the restricted journals. Let me set some of the context for you. 
In the late 1960, about 65, mid 65, 65, 66, Merton realized the, the difficulty of the Merton industry was making for the monks themselves. And who was going to manage all of this? So he set up something called the Thomas Merton Legacy Trust. The trust would look after the estate after Merton died. Now, since the average age for monks around that time was 80, it's now 90 monks, by the way, <laughs> uh, because of the nature of their lives, longevity is a big thing. I've never understood why they don't make that a quality in their vocation, you know, uh, material when they send out, live a long life, come and be a monk. But it's the rhythm, <laughs> the balance that seems to work. They don't have the stress the rest of us have raising children and everything else, living in the professional world, uh, but they, they have their own stress. But all these things make for a more regulated life, and as a consequence, generally, a long life. Well, that wasn't going to happen with Merton, and what they wrote into uh, the, uh, the contract as a codicil was the recognition that these private diaries, what were called, known as the restricted journals, could not be released until 25 years after Merton's death. The reasoning being, of course, that if Merton lives into his 80s, and 25 years after that, all the principles will be dead. But God had different things in mind, other than the lawyers on the trustee foundation and indeed the publishers. Merton died in 1968, which meant that in 1993, we would get over the next, from 93 to 99, we would have seven volumes of the restricted journals published. This was an astonishing development in contemporary scholarship. All the restricted journals then became available for everyone to read. It is the sixth volume called Learning to Love, which details in a very specific way his episode of the heart, his affair of the heart, in which he fell in love with this young nurse. Okay. Now, for many Catholics, when they first read this, of course, naturally, we would be rather stunned by it. This is not generally the activity we expect of our monks, well, not at least since the Middle Ages. And we think, wow, well, you know, they're this is going to shatter my image of Merton. I'll never read Merton again. But when people began to read the diary and realize what happened and how they parted and how he renewed his vows and how he grew in love as a consequence, they begin to be far less judgmental, begin to realize that it was a critical moment in the development of his own life. Now, he chronicles this in great detail. I'm not going to go through it all, obviously, but um, the diary brings you into the heart of this experience in the most direct way. There is no doubt that the prose entries and letters written during the course of his episode of the heart, expressing and exploring his love for M, the biographers uh, have consistently to protect her, she's a grandmother and still very much alive in Cincinnati, to protect her not to use the name. Only one biographer departed from that convention and used the name. So it is in, uh, it is in the uh, public court. But most biographers have simply restricted the uh, identifier to M. These entries were often marred by an inadequacy of language that is unexpected in a poet in Wordsmith and Merton's accomplishment. His prose suffered from strained sentiment, sentimentalization and easy reliance on cliched phrasing, bathos, and self-evident rationalization. Merton's feelings for M were genuine and his agonizing efforts to make sense of his riven life were honest, if confused. But the real depth of feeling is only truly conveyed in the 18 poems born of his love and desperation. You know, if you wa really want to understand the depth and the meaning to the degree that we can of this um, relationship, you don't have to read the restricted journals. You don't have to read the other private material that, we'll, that we now have in print Midsummer Night's uh, Diaries, one of them, the retrospect, the much more detailed analyses of these. Remember, all only from Merton's point of view. We don't know M's point of view, which means, of course, 
we don't know anywhere near the whole story. But what we do know from that record is some important things in terms of his evolution as a thinker and as a poet. But it was in the poetry that it was most beautifully expressed. Here's an example. How can I sleep exhausted, torn out of, torn out my dear school, to lie alone thinking of one day's lesson, love's new geography and form, love's new map and clear highway, where there is no other traffic, where we both now know we ride without block and without rival. Merton's chronicle of his love for M reveals him at his most vulnerable. It is not surprising that at one point in the heat of the affair, he had a dream about another girl, not M, as well as another student nurse who had come to see him briefly in hospital. In the midst of all this, he writes, I saw a tangle of dark briars and light roses. My attention singles out one beautiful pink rose, which becomes luminous, and I am much aware of the silky texture petals. My mother's face appears behind the roses, which vanish. This is very important to understand, and I'll bring this part of the lecture to a conclusion with this. Merton's relationship with the young nurse was not a sordid affair, when you read the document. Inappropriate, undoubtedly. Immature, considerably but without value. And you begin to realize, of course, the critical necessity for him to discover that he actually was lovable, that he actually could be held and he could love. Before he became a monk, before he became a Catholic, Merton was quite the roué. He had lots of girlfriends and uh, lots of relationships, but no connection. And he lives with the anxiety and the guilt of that for most of his life, and usually in reaction to it, coupled with the fact in a passage of exquisite poignancy, he talks at one point that my mother tells me she's dying by writing me a letter. When he was a child, he was six, at six at the time. His mother had cancer. She would die, cancer of the stomach. His father would die from cancer of the brain about 10 years later. He was orphaned very young, by the way. His mother was deeply protective of him and did not want him to know that there was such a thing as suffering, pain, and death, so she refused to allow him to come to see him in the hospital while she was dying. And when, before she died, she wrote him a letter telling him that she was dying. And he read it under a tree after every, all the others had gone in to be with her at her bedside. You don't recover from such psychological trauma easily. And that passage there, when he's talking about seeing his mother behind, is, I admit, Orthodox Freudianism for sure, but it is nonetheless wonderfully evocative of his struggle to connect when he experienced so early in his life various forms of emotional abandonment. So this relationship wasn't sordid. In the end, it was healing. It ended, of course. He brought it to an end. And most importantly, and publicly, he reaffirmed himself and his vows to the community of Gethsemane. Because, of course, rumors travel quickly in the monastery, and everybody knew that things were awry. But the episode itself, Puzzles most biographers and most of us who do work on Merton because you might think of it as an aberration, but if you think of it more in the context of his spiritual maturation, it takes on an entirely different hue and helps to explain how the last two years of his life were perhaps the most integrated he'd ever had because maybe just for the first time, he knew not that he was loved, because he had known that before, but that he was lovable, that he could be loved. This is a common feature in Nowen as well. 
Now in his life as a psychologist is greatly colored by his own struggle for affirmation. When after he's ordained a priest, the Cardinal Archbishop of Utrecht, Bernard Alfrink, one of the great council fathers, one of the great figures of the, uh, who aligned with Montini and Fring and Sunins and the others, and the liberal wing of the debate over the day, Ecclesia Schema and all the other stuff, preparatory commission that went on at the council. He goes to Al Alfrink and says, well, I'm going to send you to Rome to study. He says, I don't want to study the sacred sciences. I want to study the human sciences. I want to study psychology. Now, greatly to Cardinal Alfred's favor, and he will do this again later on, he says, well, it's not usually done. You've got to remember, in the 1950s, priests didn't largely study in psychology. Okay? It was considered uh, a foreign discipline and problematic, like a lot of the social sciences. You remained largely confined to the classics or the physical sciences. They were safe. You could be a biologist and a chemist and whatnot, a physicist, but a psychologist, oh, that was dangerous. So uh, with rare exceptions, you have um, Macorizon, the Jesuit, uh, not Jesuit, but the priest in, in Paris, the author of Le Mystère Humain de la Sexualité, which was a famous work in the 1960s. And a fair number of priests who are, who are actually Freudians, not Jungians, because it's easier to keep the theology separate from the psychiatry that way. With the one exception being Victor White, the Dominican at Cambridge. Now, now it's going to be the other exception. Now it goes, he goes to Nijmegen, which is a Catholic university in the South. And he studies phenomenological psychology. Phenomenological psychology teaches you to insert yourself into the eye of the subject. In other words, you have to, you, the psychologist has to empathize to a degree that he or she inserts himself into the presence of the client. What, how, do, how do I think like them? Okay, phenomenological psychology. So he gets this basis. Then he goes on, as I said earlier, to study in, uh, at the Menninger Clinic in psychiatric research. And then, very importantly, he meets the founder of the CAPE movement. Many of you may be familiar with this. When people want to learn how to be chaplains and uh, work in hospitals and everything else, they go through a training, pastoral education. Well, the person who actually founded that was a Presbyterian minister who was a forester. I always found that really fascinating. <laughs> it's a forester. By the name of Anton Boysen. Boysen founded this. Now, Boysen was a, was a psychotic. He's had five serious periods of incarceration in uh, mental institutions in the state of Massachusetts. But during that period, he de developed a spirituality and a psychology of mental illness. How do we treat our subjects? Is God to be found in madness, in, psychi in psychiatric disorder, in the pain of mental suffering? He used himself primarily as the subject and came up with a notion of not, not just, you know, people being a case study, but they were living human documents. That's Boyson's phrase. And he writes this wonderful book about himself called Out of the Depths. Appears in 1962, 1960 or 62, and then within a short period of time, now and goes to visit him. They have a meeting, and shortly after he dies in a mental institution. It's a tragic but brilliant life and full of grace. So he gets these phrases in his study of psychology. Phenomenological, phenomenological psychology based on the philosophy of Husserl and then kind of mediated through contemporary psychology gives him one leg to stand on. The other leg is Boysen's notion of individuals not being case studies but living human documents, not data. He's got those two things. Now he's ready to move. He's ready to understand human pain. Because you see, as is often the case, it is driven by a deep inner need to feel affirmed. Nowen would write on more than one occasion that the greatest pain is the pain of self-rejection. 
And it is interesting to see, agonizing to observe, that a good deal of Nouwen's life, he lived with a God who was absent. If anything, God is apophatic. God is hidden and dark and away with Nouwen. When he's talking about uh, love and affirmation, it's never palpable in his own life. He never tastes it. His brother talks about incredible examples. He would give homilies, and I don't know if many of you have, have heard Henry speak, but you will know it's performance art. And he gives himself entirely to it. And he would go back to his room afterwards. He'd sit quietly on the bed, and he would cry. Partly because of the expenditure of energy, partly because he was inconsolable. The inconsolable thing came from that his, what he called his primary wound, that he could never really believe that he was loved. When you talk to his father and to his brother, they don't understand it because there's no evidence in the family that there were anything but loving and affirming, particularly his mother. But it was built into a psychological makeup. This made him hypersensitive to those who lived on the margins or those who experienced in their life acute moments of loneliness and despair, compassion. This is the one thing you discover with now, and in all the books that you read, in all the diaries that he keeps, in all the correspondence that he, ma that he maintains, is an almost inexhaustible capacity to be compassionate. I'll give you two examples and then wrap up. Now and taught at uh, the University of Notre Dame, then he taught at Yale for 10 years, and then he taught at Harvard, and when it was all over, he uh, teaching in Ivy League universities. He, ha he arrives at Yale in 1971 and 1974. He has tenure. Virtually unheard of at Yale. He gives it all up to work at L'Arche. To move from the academy with its competitiveness, with its prominence, with its perks, with its office, its privilege, its esteem. He moves from all of that to an environment where people are held together simply and only by the bond of interdependency and love. It's a complete change of his environment. And the last 10 years of his life will be spent working at Daybreak in Toronto and traveling to large communities around the world. Now, while he's at Harvard, he has a young student, uh, Robert Jonas his name is, who's fairly well known in American Catholicism. Uh, a writer, spiritual writer, psychologist himself. He was doing his doctorate at Harvard. Mer uh, now it was his mentor. He had converted from Lutheranism, had become a Catholic, and then things waxed and waned. His own marriage fell apart. He kind of drifted from his Catholicism, fell in love with the daughter, who was herself a PhD student at Harvard, whose father was a professor at Harvard, uh, but they were Anglicans. And so they went to Nowen, and Nowen, always remaining, priest to abide by the rules, he said, I, I, you know, you, you should have an annulment. Uh, but he wouldn't have an annulment. He found it too painful and made him angry, and so there was no annulment. Now and reads him the rules, but then says, those are the rules. Here's the mercy. You need me, I'll be with you. So he doesn't preside at the ceremony, but he preaches at the ceremony, and he gives his blessing. But this is where the compassion comes in full force. Their daughter, Rebecca, is born. She survives three hours, if that, and dies. She bo born prematurely. Her lung capacity is insufficient. M regardless of the technical equipment that they have in the hospital, they can't sustain her. And she dies literally in the palm of their hands. They're destitute, devastated. Now in his way, he comes immediately to the hospital. He's there with them. And he does what he always does. He instantly enters into their pain. He doesn't stand off and exhort or indulge in cliched counseling or just simply remain a silent bystander. He comes, he hugs them, and he talks to them directly. And he says to Robert, who's the most inconsolable of the two, by the way, he says to him, you know, Rebecca's death, Jesus suffers too with her death.
What he does there is to shatter the isolation of grief. He wants him to know that the death of Rebecca is held in the hands of love of Jesus himself, who absorbs all pain and grief, that it's not just simply you alone, because the isolation that comes with grief compounds the despair. And then he tells him, you must write about this. He says, I can't. He says, oh, you will. And he does. It's a beautiful book called Rebecca, Reflections of a Grieving Father. He comes to grips with it. Another example of the, and there are countless numbers of examples, but another one is later on in now in his life, near the end of his life, he travels with his father. He wants to reconcile with his father. His father doesn't know why he wants to reconcile, because they've always got along fairly well, but Henry is Henry, and he thinks they need to reconcile. So they travel around, they go to all these Cistercian and Benedictine breweries. It's a kind of a great thing you do. You go to Belgium, the Netherlands, you travel around, look at the breweries. Then they go to Germany, they go to other places, and at one point they come across a circus. Go to a circus. And Henry falls in love with the circus, particularly the acrobats, the flying rodleys. And so they follow the circus as it goes around Germany. Wherever the circus goes, the older now and the younger now are in a car going with the circus. Now, I think as you can appreciate, the acrobats get to be a little unnerved by this. All right? And eventually they confront Henry. And they say, what are you doing? He says, I want to know what you do. It's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. I want to study it. I want to know what you think when you're up there and you're, you're the catcher or uh, you're the one swinging. I want to know what, what discipline goes on there. What, what brings you as a community? Because that's what you are. As acrobats, you are one body. You see what he's doing? This is a spiritual metaphor. And so he, he talks to them, and they talk to him. And then they begin to realize he's not a weirdo. And they love him. And he enters into their lives, and he writes a book about it. It's not been published, but he takes copious notes. And then at one point, the uh, older one, after whom the acrobatic team is named, Rodley, he marries, and they're going to have a child. And uh, it's Germany, and Germany requires, German law requires amniocentesis for all those over 40. It's a requirement, it's legal, it has to be done. Well, he was horrified by this, because he thought, well, if the baby or the fetus is in any way deformed, there'll be enormous pressure on them to destroy the fetus. And of course, he lives in a community where there are many suffer from sound, Down syndrome. So he's horrified by the implications. But of course, he doesn't isolate them, he doesn't excoriate them, but he communicates their, his fear. At the same time that the baby was born, the baby was fine, and even if, even if the baby had been deformed, the parents made it clear they would under no circumstances not brought it to term. But what they came to appreciate was that this act of Nowens was not unwarranted interference. It was not the imposition of his view. He just simply said it, but then said, I will be with you whatever decision you make. But he entered into their pain. He entered into their suffering. And you see it again and again. I'll conclude that element by just simply saying that the founder of liberation theology, Gustavo Gutierrez, um, said that Nouwen's capacity for compassion was unequaled. When he went down to work in Peru and in Bolivia, uh, he was not a good missionary. He was awkward and clumsy and you know, just didn't adapt very well. But what he brought was a capacity for compassion they couldn't get over, and that he brought that back with him to the States. Wrote a wonderful book, his diary of his time in Latin America, called Gracias. And it's the recognition by Gutierrez of this capacity for compassion that again underscores not only his pastoral and psychological strategies, but the fact that they're clear, clear, it's a clear characteristic or quality of, uh, of the man himself. Okay, let me wrap up now. I'm going on too long. Now in himself, we'll continue to record in journal form, homilies, and in essays, his peregrination. The lovely Latin phrase means going forth into strange places. That's what a pilgrim does. Peregrination is a pilgrimage. 
going forth into strange places, both metaphorical and literal. It is a generally postmodern undertaking in search of spiritual integration, holiness, which is increasingly defined in our time by its tenuousness, by its fragility, its incompleteness, its summons to exploration, its disconcerting capacity to destabilize, to surprise, to awaken, and to change. And each one of those verbs, not one of them, suggests stability, right? complacency. The spiritual life is not a comfortable life. As one seeks greater interiority, one is not invited to a facile placidity. You're invited on a tour that's going to be disconcerting, sometimes iconoclastic, if it's ever going to be transformative. That's why Nowen and Merton are good pilgrims, architects of spirituality, particularly in this postmodern variation, precisely because they know its tenuousness and its fragility. As much in their anguish as in their self-honesty, sometimes searingly forthright, Merton and Nowen shared corrosive bouts of self-doubt, compassion for the conflicted and the confounded, irrepressible energy, and almost pathological restiveness. And I remember that Merton tried, no sooner was he in the monastery, than he tried and tried counselors, ruses, subterfuges, and everything else to get himself out of the monastery. Wanted to leave, wanted to become a Carthusian, or a member of the Commodilesi, or a hermit, or something, but didn't want to be there. And so he was constantly trying to be somewhere else. One abbot rightly put it, I think, that Merton took a long time to discover that, you know, uh, the deepest acquisition is often present when you are still, not when you're traveling. It's going deeper into yourself, not just going outside and beyond yourself. And uh, uh, now it was notoriously rested. He had been working on what some consider his fa most famous book, The Return of the Prodigal Son, The Story of a Homecoming. This is his story, and it's a beautiful one. If you don't know any Nowen, you're interested in Henry Nowen, this is the book to begin with. It comes near the end of his life, but it's a beautiful book. It's his, it's his careful, detailed, I must say, analysis of Rembrandt's famous painting of the prodigal son, based on the parable from the Gospel of Luke. But what he does, and this is the genius of it, he inserts Henry Nouwen and Rembrandt into their painting, into that painting. Their spiritual struggles, okay, their call to holiness, if you like. And it was, the book was so successful that even when he had returned from his sabbatical, uh, he was to go back to the Hermitage in St. Petersburg, where the original painting is uh, located, go back there, and they were going to do a film of his painting. And uh, he was already exhausted, exhausted from a sabbatical. They gave him a sabbatical to rejuvenate, to re-energize, to restore, and he came back more exhausted than when he went. And Sister M Sue Mosteller, a sister of St. Joseph of Toronto, and his literary executor, by the way, said to him, no, 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 you, 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 must, you must, we'll ease you back in. We've got different things you're going to do. You'll be able to maintain a certain retinue and whatnot, but we need to husband your health and your energy. But he could never say no. And he flew off, not well, exhausted, had a heart attack, and he died in uh, the Netherlands. They were both surprised by their deaths, by the way. Merton's by accidental electrocution in Thailand, now and by heart attack in Holland. Neither expected to die. Merton has a lovely, well, it's a lovely entry, but he has an entry when he's 46 in one of his diaries, and he says, I think I'm going to die soon. I know that I will die soon. Seven years later, he will. Now and, now and seems indifferent. Well, this is interesting. He's ambivalent about death. He's haunted by death. 
He writes about death all the time. There are several books. Anyone here in this room interested in uh, thanatology, palliative care, hospice work, and whatnot, read his books on in memoriam and care and caregiving and whatnot. You'll see a remarkable ability to understand the ars moriendi, the art of befriending your death. Having said all that, he never befriended his own death. He was fearful of it, and he took him by stealth. And he died in one sense, mercifully, not lingering, but in another way, according to a scenario he most feared, utterly alone. You see, they had, the family had come. He recovered from the first heart attack. And the doctors and the family and Henry himself were satisfied he was on recovery mode. They took him out of, uh, out of inter uh, intensive care and moved him to a different room. And uh, everyone dispersed. And people from North America did not fly over because he told them by phone, don't come, I'm recovering. And he died during the night with no one around. And there is uh, the scenes of his father's arriving, who is in his 90s, and to whom he dedicated the book, The Return of the Prodigal Son, uh, sat at the end of the bed and wept and said, it should have been me. His father, in fact, would be dead within the year. In a way, the drama of their passing only in part explains our fascination with their lives. After all, it is the drama of their spirituality that compels us to attend to them. As the Jesuit Drew Christensen said in America Magazine, what is integrating and unifying for religious people is not some theological framework, but their experience of holiness in others and the striving for holiness in their own lives. And through the prism of that holiness, the overwhelming holiness of God. Well, tonight, even if only for an hour, by gleaning, if you like, the holiness of Noun and Merton in their numerous writings, essays, letters, diaries. I've concentrated mostly on the diaries, but the volume of material of both of them is, would fill several shelves. I've just tried it in a way to distill some of the kernels or major features of their thinking. What we need to know is that these two 20th century masters of the spiritual life, principal architects, of spirituality for our time, if only vicariously, have allowed us to enter into the temple of their respective souls, because both of them, in their writing and in their spirituality, were pioneers extraordinaire of the landscape of the holy. I'd be happy to entertain questions for a few minutes. How much time do I have? Two days? <laughs> yeah. That's right. I would just say a few questions anyway. If you're, there's a microphone there, I think it's operational, right? If anyone wants to come up and ask a question or seek some clarification or elaboration that I can provide, I'd be happy to do so. Dr. Higgins, you spoke of um, Merton learning the, uh, the art of stillness. And I remember a line from one of his works, which I can't remember which one it comes from, unfortunately, but he talks about the pervasive form of contemporary violence being this lack of stillness in our modern lives. I was wondering if you could maybe speak to that a little bit. He was quite concerned about uh, violence. He wrote about violence in, in uh, several ways, institutional violence, uh, war, the violence over race relations. Um, there are fairly detailed instances of these being chronicled because I, uh, Merton understood, uh, again, because he was born d during a war, um, he had his own searing exposure 
in a special moment in a field south of Koblenz in Germany. It was the early 1930s. It was just before the election of Hitler as Chancellor of the Reich. And uh, as he was walking quietly in a field, a car came by with Hitler youth clenching their fists at him and drove him off, off the road. And he records this as a palpable instance of encountering people who had the will to destroy him. A couple of years later, when he was on a, uh, heading back to, or going to the United States, he would go to Columbia University, he would leave Europe, which you would call that sad, unquiet continent, full of foreboding, which is of Europe, poised for war, about 1935. And he leaves, and he's on a, on a um, ship called the SS Manhattan. And the SS Manhattan has many, it's a German ship, and many of the stewards are Nazis and they harass the Jewish uh, travelers on the ship. And he's witness to this. This is before Kristonacht, this is before uh, Vance, this is before the final solution, anything else, but it's the beginning. It's around the time of the Nuremberg Laws. And already he, so he, he tastes this kind of violence in very palpable ways. Also, uh, he's in the States during the great upheaval. Um, because of the, of the Vietnam War. Uh, Vietnamese monks, Buddhist monks come to see him. The American bishops, under pressure from uh, Rome and from the abbot uh, general, uh, Gabriel Sorte, put pressure on Merton. Merton cannot write about peace, and cannot write about war. Couldn't write about nuclear war, couldn't write about anything. He was censored for a couple of years, and it's, a, it's lovely, I just love the way he does this. So he's a, he's a loyal monk. He says, okay, I can't publish. But that doesn't mean that I can't Gestetner. Do you remember the Gestetner? Those, <laughs> those of you who are old enough will remember, we used to, the, those who are teachers or wherever in class, we, we had to put them on this big bin. You put this thing and you rolled it around in ink and all this stuff came out and the ink was so potent it intoxicated the kids for hours. And you, wa <laughs> you walked around covered with purple stuff that was ineradicable. That was the Gestetner. So, Merton figured, okay, I can't publish, but nobody said I couldn't Gestetner. So we have 111 what are called the Cold War letters. And they're extraordinary. So to protect the anonymity of his interlocutor, you only use uh, initials. So he was writing the famous people as a correspondence with Eric Fromm and all kinds of people, famous people. But you have to try and figure out what the initials are because he was told that he couldn't publish. In uh, 1965, the um, bishops lifted the ban and uh, all his work on peace came out, and peace and around violence. And then, of course, his bigger concern after the Cuban Missile Crisis and some of those cases was the mounting violence inherent in uh, civil, the uh, civil issue around race and um, uh, the importance of, of uh, developing Ca deep Catholic thinking around pacifism became, uh, there were great debates around this. Uh, Daniel Berrigan, Gordon Zahn, Roger Laporte, who emulated himself, were uh, pacifists of a rather extreme form. Merton wasn't, but Merton made an argument for a form of pacifism on the basis of rereading the Contraselsum by origin. Uh, this, and this is classic Merton. This is classic Merton. When Merton wants to make a point, he goes back to the sources. This is why he's a great figure in his own way, anticipating the council. The council was about the recovery of the sources, right? The ressourcement. And this is what Merton did. He went back to the sources. What did Bernard of Claveau say? What did Guigo of the Carthusian say? What did Eric of Rivaux say? And he translates them, and he writes commentaries on them. And so when he wants to be a hermit, and the abbot says, you can't be a hermit because it's not in the tradition of the monks. He says, well, in the 12th century we did it. <laughs> and eventually the abbot relents. So this is what Merton would do. He'd say, well, what are the roots? What's our tradition? And he would often find subterranean or alternate or marginal streams. Now, we know the Catholic Church is not by its nature pacifist. We have never been 
pacifist. We, we've actually been quite harsh about pacifists. The pacifist tradition is alive and well among Quakers and Mennonites. It's not a particular Catholic tradition. We're kind of fond of the Crusades and religious wars and burning people, that's our kind of thing. So we, we, <laughs> we, have, a, we have a certain ignominious history on this regard, but we also have a countertext that shows that there are legitimate roots within the larger main tradition that shows that pacifism is an acceptable Catholic option. So we had conscientious objectors like Gordon Zahn and of course the now blessed or sainted Franz Jagerstatter. Uh, Jagerstatter was killed by the Nazis because he refused to join the Wehrmacht. He was an Austrian. Everybody put pressure on him, including his bishop, obey the German authorities. This was after the Anschluss. So Austria is now part of German, part of the New Reich. Jagerstatter says no, on the basis of the reading of the gospel. So his parish priest and his bishop would say, you know more theology and canon law than your spiritual figures? And he would say, the gospel, and he'd quote directly from the, but they would say, wow, this is a form of fundamentalism. He said, no. This is what we must do. We must not harm others. I will not take up arms against others. One man in all of Austria, they beheaded him in the village. His name was expunged from the records in Austria. He's now Austria's saint. Now they say, well, there was one Austrian who said no to the Anschluss. So when Cardinal Innitzer of Vienna was ringing the bells for Hitler's troops, a few years later, one man would be beheaded in a public square because he could not see how his conscience would work against his church and his God, regardless of the pressures from family and bishops. Merton wrote uh, an excellent essay on Gordon Zahn's major work in Solitary Witness which is about this man. Jagerstatter was not a priest, by the way. He was a layman. He was a farmer. He had a family. There would be many who would suffer by his death, but he could see no way out. Merton wanted to understand well, what would compel somebody to do this. He goes back and he finds there is a tradition of pure pacifism within the larger Catholic tradition of the just war. Okay? And that's what he does. That's a very long-winded response to a very <laughs> focused and simple question, <laughs> Melissa, but they asked for it. Are there any others? Yes? Yeah. Um, you spoke about the gift of sexuality in terms of how that opened up Merton's world. Can you speak about sexuality and what, what that did for, um, for Nowen? Because you haven't, you, you, and it, you may have been wanting to do that. I'm just wondering how that played out in terms of his spiritual formation. Uh, very good question. I will answer that. Um, Henry, from a very, from early on in his ministry, knew that he was homosexual. He remained uh, uh, celibate, by the way. Um, he took his vows very seriously as a priest. He fell in love with um, a member of the large community in France and uh, had to work through that. It is that experience of falling in love that precipitated the clinical depression that took him to Winnipeg. And then he had to work his way through that and work his way back into the community. It's a transition of stunning, record of stunning pain and maturity. There was a lot of pressure on Henry, we know this from the records, uh, to, from the, the gay community, both in North America and abroad, for him to become a spokesperson for them, and he would not. Uh, this caused him a lot of personal pain, but he felt that to do so would politicize this, and he did not want to be in any way partisan, and he saw that his ministry was the ministry of the gospel to everyone, and that if he were to be labeled by the media or by other, others as the gay priest, then his ministry would be diminished. So it was with a lot of pain, because a lot of gay Catholics uh, 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 wrote to him, sought his counsel, um, identified with him, and he speaks, he speaks about it, but he, it, it elliptically, 
in fact, the book that deals most especially with the post-Winnipeg is frustrating, uh, exquisitely crafted in its evocation of personal pain, but devoid of any kind of specific reference. So you have no sense of what he's really talking about. It's coded. He couldn't bring himself to that same level. Now, in Merton's case, it was, of course, in the restricted diaries. Uh, and that's where, where it all comes out. Merton, Merton didn't publish, they never appeared in the published diaries during his life. Um, but with Nouwen, it was a matter of integrating that sexuality within the larger experience of who he is as Henry Nouwen. I'm not inclined to think that his sense of self-rejection uh, is grounded in any kind of sexual persecution or uh, angst. I think, that, um, I think that primal wound that he talks about is independent of his sexual orientation, but certainly his sexual orientation would have compounded that sense of difference and isolation and marginalization. You've got to remember, in the early years of his training in the 1950s, he would have received uh, a training which is distinguished by its repression. Um, John Oates Bamberger is a psychiatrist. He's also a monk. And he was the spiritual director for Henry Now. He was the abbot of the Abbey of the Genesee, and he was a disciple, friend, and former novice under Thomas Merton. So Bamberger knows both men very well. And in the book, that I've written on now and called Genius Born of Anguish, I quote uh, extensively from a 1965 letter in which Bamberger tells Nowen what is wrong and that if he doesn't get this right, he will have a breakdown. And he does. He tells him at one point, he says to him, you're too unforgiving with yourself. And he says, you're too much like your countrymen. Cornelius Jansis, Jansinus. And of course, he was the Bishop of Ypres, uh, who was, no, not Ypres, but Utrecht, who was condemned for Jansenism, which is a variant of Catholic Puritanism. All right. And he says, you, 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 you're a Pelagian and you're a Jansenist. You fear the body and you think you have to earn God's love, and neither is true. But that would have been in no small part the culture of clerical formation in post-Second World War Dutch seminaries. So he's shaped in great measure by, obviously, the clerical formation he receives. That undergoes a shattering, if you like, because of the council and post-council developments. And as many of you may know, the Dutch church becomes really quite renegade, remember? We have the Dutch Catechism, then the Pope calls the Dutch Synod, and then we have Alfred dies, and he's replaced by a very conservative Archbishop, Adriana, Adrianus Simonis, in, in efforts to kind of bring stability back to Holland. It doesn't work, of course, at all. And during all this acute turmoil in the Dutch church, now and is away. He's in North America, writing about it. And it is interesting to see how many of the priests in his diocese actually resent his being away. You know, you left us during the great turmoil. But there was great turmoil in the United States as well. And, Mert and Nowen rather had to follow what he thought were the signs, you know, the discernment of where he should be to be a most effective minister of the gospel. That's how he saw himself. Whether he's teaching psychology at an Ivy League university, whether he's writing books for the general public, whether he's giving retreats, engaged in ecumenical activity, or social justice witness, whether he's living in the barrios in Latin America or living in Cistercian cloisters in the Abbey of the Genesee, no matter what he's doing, he's trying to discern God's way for him to be a credible and meaningful minister of the gospel of salvation. That's how he saw himself. Okay, thank you, and thank you for showing up tonight. I'm going to now call on Mary McLaughlin, a longstanding friend of Dr. Higgins of King's College and of uh, King's University Parish.
to offer some closing remarks. Thanks, Melissa. Good evening, everybody. Um, I am also terribly glad that to, so many of you came out. Uh, how could we not be joyful to have uh, experienced this time with, with dear Dr. Higgins? Uh, you know, before my association with King's University College and this beautiful chapel and our wonderful Father Michael Bayshard, I, um, I too was involved at St. Jerome's and in Waterloo. Uh, it's a resurrectionist uh, university, so they'd always had priests as the chair. Then they actually had a layman, and then guess what happened? I happened. I became the chair of the board. Dr. Higgins wasn't quite sure how this was going to work out. And I must tell you, I wasn't either. So you've heard of people dancing around a bit to sort of get to know one another. That's kind of what we did. Um, what I did know at the time, and I think you all know this, is if you want someone's respect, you cannot be in awe of them. And you cannot be afraid of them. I've never been afraid of Michael but I certainly now have the privilege of being in awe of him. Over these years, Michael has been a very dear friend to our family, to, to friends. We've seen him in so many different aspects of his life. Uh, we have grown to love him. Uh, we do consider him a great friend. And the awe part remains uh, as you experience tonight. Um, it's kind of, I'm not short on words usually, but um, I guess really the, the most I can say is thank you, thank you, thank you, our dear friend, Dr. Michael Higgins. We love you. Thank you. Um, if you will please join us downstairs for some refreshments and the donations tonight as uh, always uh, for this academic year are, are going toward the Hospitality Center of the Sisters of St. Joseph as well as, um, I just forgot our other <laughs> place. Yes, the Crisis Pregnancy Center here in London as well. My apologies. Thank you again for joining us. And uh, we will be... Uh, resuming uh, the lecture series for the new year just as uh, an announcement as um, Michael, uh, Father Michael Bichard mentioned last week that we will be um, in the new building, the Student Life Center, um, as of January for our lecture that month, uh, which will be Dr. Abuelaish uh, joining us, but uh, further information at the back table. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. It's good, thank you.